James Fletcher Goodman. I was born in 1943. And Say, were you born here in Raleigh? I was born in St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh my gosh. My mom, Betty Lou Fletcher, uh, and uh, grandmother were in Florida for the summer. And I was born in August in Florida. I think I lived there a week. <laughs> So I said, I tell everybody I'm from Raleigh. Well, I think that's appropriate, and okay. you and you were. You just were on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was born on vacation. There you go. So tell us about your uh, early childhood and your family. Or were you an only child, or? Um. So my mother. All right. So there, uh, my grandfather A.J. Fletcher had three sons. All in broadcasting, Fred, Frank and Floyd, and he had one daughter, Betty Lou. So I'm, I'm Betty Lou's son. People say, people ask me sometimes, how can you work for those Fletchers? <laughs> I, I say, here's a weather bulletin <laughs> from Greg Fishel, excuse me. That's okay. Um, and so, um, my mom married. Uh, I was born. Uh, she then divorced and uh, three or four years later remarried. So I grew up in my grandfather's house. And that was Mr. A.J. Fletcher? That's Mr. Yes, at 909 Glenwood Avenue. Oh my gosh. Right now that's where the Fletcher Foundation is located. Really? In that house. And mom uh, remarried and uh, built a house behind that house. So I lived behind 909. Wow, that's terrific. What, what were you interested in and growing up? I have up? a brother. You have a brother? Ray, mm -hmm. he's nine years younger than I am. Okay. Um, an attorney. I, you know, I think that from WRL TV went on the air in December of 1956. December the 12th. Um, and I was at the sign on, my grandfather and I rode out to the transmitter. Um, and I, something's happened. Um, and I, I became very interested in broadcasting and uh, stayed with it from then on. I was, uh, uh, my, my grandfather, uh, encouraged our chief engineer then, Virgil Duncan, to take care of Jimmy. Uh, uh, so I worked with him and uh, you know became an audio operator crew and eventually went through the whole. Uh, I, I think I've had about every job in the place, but the, um, I, was, I was born in 43, so I was 12, almost 13 when we went on the air. And so when I started working here, they paid me out of petty cash because it was against the law to work at that age. So let's go back for just a minute. Yeah. So let's go back to your uh, school day interests. And uh, did you go to school here in Raleigh? And, and eventually you went on to college? Let's talk a little yeah, bit okay. about that. Yeah, okay. I went to, I, yes, I went to uh, uh, Daniels Junior High here in Raleigh, first year it opened, and Needham Broughton High School. And there'll, there'll never be any happier days uh, than going to uh, Needham Broughton High School, walk to school. Wow. I just live right on, down there on Glenwood Avenue. Uh, I, th I then went to Duke. I, I had decided that to be in broadcasting, you needed to be an electrical engineer. And uh, I stuck with that for about three years and realized that I was a lot more interested in um, what technology can do. How can you use a technology? I was much more interested in that than the equation um, for, for how it really works. I decided to change majors um, and uh, join the Naval Reserve um, that, that was during Vietnam, and um, I knew you, if you, you finish school, you get drafted 
you don't finish school, you get drafted. So I joined the reserve, Navy Reserve, and I was in the reserves for three years and uh, did not uh, go back and finish school, came back after the Navy to the company and went to work. Something else happened while you were in the Navy or shortly thereafter. Where were you stationed at? I was in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, actually Millington, Tennessee, a suburb of Memphis. Uh, a, a naval air station, largest inland naval air station in the world, lots of uh, uh, training for naval aviation. I met Barbara Goodman. I met Barbara Lyons, who later became Barbara <laughs> Goodman. We met there. And you brought her back to Raleigh. Yeah, well, I, I got out of the Navy, came back. I think I was here a year or two before we got married, but we did. Well, and while I was in Memphis, um, I operated Link flight simulators uh, and at night I was the uh, night studio engineer for WHBQ uh, in Memphis Channel 13 it was a so RKO station and so I stayed with the broadcasting yeah tell us what link simulators are link simulator links the name of a company mm -hmm. link and they build uh, uh, a, they'll, they'll do a mock-up of a cockpit of an airplane, uh, all of the instruments, the, the full, you, you think you're sitting in the airplane, and then with a computer, you simulate actual flight conditions. And so pilots train and train and train, and you, uh, you, as you're operating the trainer, you have a program of giving them a problem. The engine fails, or this happens, or that happens. Uh, and you know, those in those uh, high-performance aircraft, you don't have a lot of time to ponder what you ought to do. It's, it's a, so they learn reactions. They react to certain things. And you were in charge of that? Uh, I, I operated the simulators. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, very interesting that that's what you did. So you returned back and came back to Raleigh about 1968. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what was your, uh, when you came back, you went to work at WRAL. What did you do? Well, the, uh, I worked in operations. Um, the, I think uh, I viewed it as my job was to get the programming on the air. Right, I wasn't in programming, uh, but it, the job was to get it on the air. And who did you report to at that time? I reported to Jesse Helms. So, who the, later became senator? Later, yeah, Jesse Helms was the executive vice president. My grandfather was chair, was uh, president. Uh, my uncle Fred was executive vice president, and uh, Jesse Helms was executive. Vice. Fred later became president, but those were the three. My grandfather, my uncle, and Jesse Helms. And that Senator Helms had um, responsibility for. Uh, the other building we call it, which was programming and production and news. F Fred Fletcher was very much the community uh, involved in the community and handled sales uh, and promotion. So let's go back for just a minute. Yeah. Let's go back to uh, Jim Goodman at age 13. Mm -hmm. WRAL goes on the air, December 1956. There was quite an array of dignitaries and things for when that all happened. I don't know if it was the day you went on the air, but I've heard you speak before about uh, General Sarnoff coming and being here. Who were some of the people that came Yeah, that? I think it was Robert Sarnoff. I don't think it was General Sarnoff. Okay. And Dorothy Collins from Hit Parade. Okay, now remember, I was 12, 13, and I wasn't at that... Uh, uh, I think that's the groundbreaking for this building, mm -hmm. I believe, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, we became an NBC affiliate, and part of it was uh, my grandfather working with Robert Sarnoff. There's, there's, I want, let me give you a few interesting side notes here, which I think uh, is really interesting. Okay, Fred, Frank, and Floyd. Frank Fletcher went to law school. He then went to Washington and went to work for the Federal Radio Commission. It wasn't the FCC, it was the Federal Radio Commission. And he called his father 
and he called his brother Floyd and said, uh, there's this new thing called radio. And I think you all should, should get in this business. And they did. So here comes WRL AM. And my um, uncle Floyd um, ended up with WTIK in Durham. And so that was 1937 when they got their first radio station. Yes, their AM. And then two years later, what became WPTF, is that correct? Or was the first station, uh, the, the AM, which became PJL, P WPJL? The, okay, the uh, WRAL AM signed on, on that date. It was not at the frequency that it went to 1240. Okay. Remember 640? 1240 Conrad? Mm -hmm. Remember the jingles? 640, 1240 Conrad. That was the alert stations. Oh, okay. Um, so it was on 1240, and uh, then my, my grandfather decided to sell uh, WRLAM. I'm not sure why. I was off in the Navy and let him hear about it when he told me about it. But uh, okay, it was 1,000 watt daytime, 250 night. You couldn't get it outside of downtown Raleigh. It wasn't much of a uh, wasn't much of a signal. But now Fred, okay, well, I'm I want to get my uncles in here. Okay, Frank Fletcher in Washington Federal Radio Commission. There are thirty some stations in North Carolina that Frank put on the air. Right, he was right at the beginning of this, and and so he with uh, their owners all over the state, uh, stations all over the state that he uh, was the legal representation to put him on the air. So Floyd is in the business in Durham, Pop's in the uh, business here, and Fred did the morning show on WRLAM. He's very much a, an entertainer, uh, and everybody listened to, uh, it was called Tempest Fugit. Tempest Fugit. It's a book. Tempest Fugit. It is a book. So he uh, he did the morning show, and I remember uh, he would call the hospital and talk to the nurse. Was anybody born last night? And he you know he'd call around town, and he, it's good old time local radio, wow. right? And I see that uh, that's I still think that. I mean, I grew up in that. I, I haven't moved on to the. This is all about. Um, return on equity or something. I still believe in local broadcasting because that's how I learned. So, and he had, um, and there's a website for this. He did a fairy tale every morning. Fred Fletcher's fairy tales. And we put them on the web with illustrations. And you, you should hear it. So along comes FM. I guess you have the year for that, don't you? You know, I think I do. I okay. think that uh, maybe that happened in, uh, well, I'm not sure exactly. I, um, that was a few years later, though. It was, a, and you know, an interesting thing about FM was it was a 250,000 watt license. They don't do those anymore. It was, a, it was, on, the, it was on the same antenna as WRLAM. It was a 250,000 watt license. An important uh, 1946. Thank you. Um, it was important in this way. So, um, and as I really want people to know about this. I'm afraid people forget about this. Uh, so the idea is we need to do a statewide news network. So we formed. Uh, the Tobacco Radio Network, and it was an FM relay. It was FM, and that was in 1942 that that began, the Tobacco uh, Radio Network, uh, and, and it was all relayed by FM. All relayed by FM. In other words, this station would take it, and then the next station would take it, and then the next station would take it. And uh, then uh, there was an interest in doing sports, uh, with Ray Reeve and Bill Curry. Uh, there, was, there was just a long history of doing statewide stuff across the state by the company. I'm um, really proud of that. It ended up uh, 
and an, another important, I, I'm running ahead and behind a little bit because I want to make sure I talk about uh, the tobacco radio network and the tobacco farm network. So early on, there were lots of farmers and advertisers believed, and they, it was right, that you can reach them through broadcast media. So we had a, a fellow, his name was Ray Wilkinson, our farm broadcaster, and we organized crop networks throughout the southeast. We had the hog network, the soybean network, the corn network, the cotton network, and he would produce programming about those crops uh, sell advertising to go in those programs and then we would place those programs on radio stations all over the southeast in, w had a, in which that crop was grown. I think he's, he's one, I, I believe Ray's one of the top farm broadcasters in the country. So I was, I was very proud that we did and we always had the farm news on our noon news. You know it's funny the consultants would come in and uh, we said, okay, how can we improve our news ratings? And the first, one of the first things you say is, well, that, we don't think you should do the farm news. And I'd always say, okay, well, what's next? Because <laughs> we're going to do the farm news. Uh, we have to get the Chicago Board of Trade numbers every day at noon. So I really, so that's a, uh, the Tobacco Network, the North Carolina News Network, the Sports Network, all that was a big part of the early Capital Broadcasting, early WRL, and WRL FM. I, I think that that was sort of viewed as how we're going to relay this programming. It was a pretty good while before um, we finally said, you know, maybe we should try to develop this FM station as a radio station. So I remember we got uh, a thousand car tuners. Right, the cars, car radios did not have FM. So it was a little box that you put in your car and you plug your antenna into that and you take the output of that and plug it into your radio uh, to get people interested in FM. And the idea was uh, beautiful music. Not much, like sort of, it was background music. Now, I'm glad you asked about background music. <laughs> There's a fellow in Raleigh named Woody Hayes. Woody Hayes had a trio. Woody was a great organ player. Woody started uh, an operation. He had a record player in his basement. And he ordered phone lines to go like to your restaurant or your restaurant or your, it was really the, sort of the first background music and that was playing records in his basement and a phone line that went to every place. He had maybe 50, 60 customers. And that was the only way to get it there. That, that was, was the only way to get it away. That was the only network that existed. Yeah, yeah. and so um, the, we looked at uh, FM SCAs subcarrier authorizations and so there was a technology that you could on your FM station send another signal that could only be picked up by a special receiver, an SCA receiver. So we bought Woody Hayes background music and converted it to FM SCA oh my God. and built, uh, eventually built a background music company with uh, 3,500 subscribers. It was a big big operation. Well, it's not the first time that you've distributed antennas, and let's let's go back a little bit to yeah. where, um, you know, you were... Uh, right. Working working for Virgil Duncan. Okay. Uh, Virgil was big on making field intensity measurements. <laughs> he always <laughs> wanted to know how the signal was. <laughs> and uh, so in the summers, we'd take off in his Studebaker, and while we were out uh, you know, to make field intensity measurements, uh, you, you need to go out on a radial, so you're driving all around to get back to your radial, and there's so many so far apart, the radials are so far apart. We would stop by and give away antennas uh, to WRAL. See, a big part of uh, 
the question is, as you know, uh, what down east counties are are they in uh, the Raleigh Raleigh Durham market or the Greenville Washington Newburn market? So we worked really hard to get people down there uh, to watch WRLA. We did that by giving away antennas, and I still give away antennas. <laughs> You want an antenna? I've got a, I've got a real good one. It's a new one. <laughs> I, I might need one. As I told you, I, I'm sad because where I live, I can't get yeah, WRL. No, I mean, that, that's, a, that's, what, that's the deal. Is the, mm -hmm. uh, You have an antenna and you can, get us, uh, you can get us for free. So, yes, and I did a lot of engineering work with um, Virgil Duncan. That was the field measurements and giving away the antennas. Uh, they, okay, so... How, okay, AM, FM, here comes television. Nobody knew anything about television. Once again, here's Uncle Frank Fletcher uh, suggesting that, that uh, WREL should apply for the license here in Raleigh. So he's the attorney that's in Washington, D.C., and he's advising his brothers that this is coming and we need to be involved. Yes, this is next. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, we applied. Let's see, we were 56, 30, maybe I was 10 when they started the app. It was a three or four year process. And the way it worked then is you would apply, anybody could apply. Uh, we make an application, and then the FCC goes through a hearing process. They have a hearing examiner, and the the hearing ex also comes to town, interviews people, asks people to tell them. I mean, it was a very long and complicated process. I remember uh, well. My grandfather would get home from Washington D.C. on Friday night. We'd go over to the seaboard station and pick him up. And then he'd leave again Monday or Tuesday. It was a very long um, competition. Our competition was Durham Life Insurance Company. Now, I like to, uh, this is David and Goliath. So here's David uh, with a thousand watt daytime, 250 at night small company, and here's Durham Life Insurance Company, a remarkable organization, very successful, with WPTF, 680, 50 kilowatts, big time, very big, uh, and very good operation. One of the 50,000 watt clear channel stations in the country. So, um, I think, now you gotta remember that my reaction to this comes later. I was 12, 13, 14. Um, that um, Frank Fletcher is just a terrific hearing, uh, hearing lawyer. Uh, we were well prepared uh, and we made significant uh, commitments as it relates to community service. And lo and behold, we won the thing. I guess if you, I, if you ask me, uh, my grandfather's most significant accomplishment, I, that was right up there. Now, so he was a lawyer. Now, what, he wasn't a broad, he was a business person. He wasn't a broadcaster, right? He couldn't go over and tell you actually what's going on in the station and how stuff works. So he was, he was a lawyer, he was a surety lawyer, and um, he started a life insurance company in the 20s, Dixie Life Insurance Company. During the Depression, he didn't have enough money to make his reserves, so he sold two-thirds of the company to a family in Greensboro, the Carter family, Wilbur Carter. And um, he retained a third of it. So how, so when you go to the FCC and say, I want, I want this television station, you have to show the FCC that you have the financial wherewithal to own the station. 
build a tower, equipment, build all that kind of, you need a right much money. And he was able to uh, pledge his Dixie livestock, which had become Southern livestock, in order to get the loan to get the grant to put the station on the air. Now, I was a director of Southern Life with my grandfather for, for many years. They sold um, to Liberty, have a nice building in downtown Greensboro with a hotel. So that was, that was, uh, that was a pretty good day's work, getting that grant. It sure was. Now, meanwhile, Uncle Floyd in Durham, combined with WDNC, the people with WDNC radio, and they went in together, and I believe there was no opposition, for, w, for Channel 11 in Durham, and he got that grant, and he got that station on the air before WRAL was on the air. So Channel 11 came on first? Yes. And then RAL? Yes, and a, a family, a note of family interest, is that uh, WTVD had NBC. Oh. So getting NBC away from WTVD didn't go over too well in the family. I don't think my grandmother ever got over it, really. Right? I mean, so uh, here comes NBC over here from Durham, and off we go. Now, Floyd Fletcher, uh, sold the station, he and his partner sold the stations to Cap Cities. Uh, there was a second station that Cap Cities owned, they owned Buffalo, then they bought Durham. He did that, he retired early, he did that in his early 50s. So he sold that to Cap Cities and became part of Cap Cities Long Range, which became ABC, which became, uh, so that's quite a story over there. Sure is. So why did NBC decide to change affiliations? Because didn't WRAL go on the air as the NBC affiliate, yes. or did that come later? No, we went on the air as the NBC affiliate, and, and I don't know. I told you, I was 13. Um, How long were you NBC in that first run? Okay, so in 1963, uh, maybe, I was in school. Uh, my grandfather was in Duke Hospital um, uh, with a minor operation. Uh, I would stop by and see him after class. And uh, I know we'll forget it one, one afternoon. He said, I want, he said, I want you to call Fred and tell him that I want to switch to ABC. I think I said, what medications are you on? <laughs> <laughs> Can I help you here? Uh, what's going on? In, in, in any event, he had had... Um, a falling out with NBC over, um, NBC wanted some payments, wanted us to pay for things, and uh, he, uh, Pop felt like the relationship was becoming one-sided. Now that was, uh, he had developed a friendship with Leonard Goldenson, who was chairman of ABC, well-known, uh, and um, he um, made a deal with Leonard Goldenson to switch. Now you got to remember then that ABC wasn't really a network. They had American Bandstand, Marcus Welby, um, FBI. Well, I'm not. They were they were not anything like the full service network that NBC was, and so we stayed with uh, NBC News. Huntley Brinkley, we kept some uh, NBC programming, but switched to ABC and were there until Cap Cities, now remember they owned Durham, bought the ABC network. 
So our competition here in this market, Channel 11, owned ABC and it was our network. That presented some uh, difficulties and over time uh, we negotiated, uh, we, uh, so we looked at NBC and we looked at CBS and decided to go with CBS. So there you go, NBC, ABC, CBS, and we were with CBS for 30 years. So that's the, so I want you to know about Fred, Frank, and Floyd. Um, Frank getting all, being, representing so many broadcasters in North Carolina and getting them on the air. And Fred uh, being president here was, um, well, I hope that I can be, I, I hope that I can get close to the care and uh, concern about the community that he had. He was chairman of the Raleigh Recreation Commission for 30 years. I mean, he was really a terrific fellow. Well, let's talk a little bit about your return to uh, WRAL. Okay. Um, you've uh, gone into the I'm Naval Reserve. I'm getting all Reserve. out of order here. I'm messing you up. <laughs> you are messing me okay, up. Okay, all right. All. <laughs> this is fascinating. It's great. But uh, you come back to work and uh, you report to Jesse Helms and uh, you're the operations manager and you start moving up the ladder. Good question. Uh, there were other Fletcher children. How did you, because of your relationship and working all the way along, yeah. did they see you as a shining star coming up through the family? Well, uh, there two, I think there, uh, there are two or three responses to that. Um, There's a picture, there's a baby picture of me in my grandfather's scrapbook. Now, he was big on scrapbooks. He worked on all of us about keeping a scrapbook. He would always say, now look, don't forget, this is really good what happened today. Don't forget to get a picture of it and put it in a scrapbook. He would give me scrapbooks, empty scrapbooks, and tell me to make sure I'd use them. Uh, and I have his scrapbooks, and in one of his scrapbooks is a picture of me and it says counting on this one so one theory is that he for some reason decided that early on I think the other uh, notion is that now my my brother now never worked here but inherited stock in the company uh, I think Maybe we were his daughter's children is a one idea. Uh, but but whatever it is, he's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> no, I couldn't have had more interest than I did. Right. I mean, I really wanted to do it. That's the right. uh, well, I'm not saying he's lucky, but I was I was really interested in it, and um, I think that he saw. Some potential. That's the only um, uh, we ne we never really talked about it. That now, of course, was not um, everybody in the family didn't like that, and it was a difficult situation. And my view of that is that my grandfather could have handled all that differently, but he didn't. A little later on, uh, I bought my brother out. He was attorney, reti a retired attorney, and uh, so here we go. So let's talk a little bit about the programming on WRAL. You had mentioned uh, some interesting things uh, uh, that your uh, your uncle Fred did a morning radio show, and he was a wonderful personality. And we're in the time when local stations did great local shows. Right. In fact, uh, we did a uh, we spoke with Jim Hevner, who talked about the fact that he was on WRAL one time and did a bowling show, I believe. Yeah. Uh, that you did well, live. We did bowling live. Uh, yeah. Out at the uh, the lanes. Uh, and we did, by the way, when we got to television, Fred did a tuning in with Fletcher on television. And it was Fred and Paul Montgomery and David Witherspoon um, 
singing and playing and, and uh, uh, messing around. A bowling show, um, really interested in high school sports. Um, oh, and a big project was the Golden Agers. Well, tell us about that. Golden Agers uh, was part of the Raleigh Recreation, and they started a group, I think, I'm not sure, I think it's maybe 60. You can be part of the Golden Agers, and at the recreation centers, they had programming activities for the Golden Agers. So Fred started the annual Golden Agers turkey, uh, Christmas turkey lunch. And uh, the first one was in Studio A over here. We had, I don't know, 25 or 30 people. Win Dixie, remember Win Dixie? Yeah. Uh, Ivan Hardesty, Win Dixie, they, were very, they provided the turkey. Um, this year, we had 2,500, 3,000 golden agers at the Christmas turkey dinner down at the Civic Center. And that's in 2017. Yeah. Wow. So we stayed wow. with that. Wow. Well, the golden age of television, lots of local programs. You're heavily involved in the community. Yeah, you, you know, remember another thing that's, uh, that, remember everything was live. I mean, you wouldn't think about that now. Uh, uh, I have to tell people about our news. Uh, the weather was sponsored by uh, Atlantic. And we'd say, uh, it's time for the Atlantic weather. We'd play Atlantic, keeps your car on the go. And the weatherman would come out in a, a filling station suit, an Atlantic fill it with his head on, and do the Atlantic weather. Bob Caudle, you remember who I'm talking about. And we did a commercial, it was live. We turned it, swing the cameras around and do a live commercial right in the middle of the news. It was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people would say it was pretty good. Well, it was pretty good, but you know, from a production quality point of view, it was, uh, it was pretty bad and the news was really, uh, uh, we have an anchor, the Sam Beard was our first big anchor. And there'd be four or five reporters lined up next to a podium. And Sam would say something like, there was a fire today at Meredith College. Here's Ben Runkle with a report. And we'd switch to Ben, standing behind the podium. He'd say, there was a fire today at Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got, right. And then we got film and then, uh, oh my gosh, getting the film edited and on the air at the right time was something. And those were the days of film. Once you shot it, yes. you had to come back here and develop it. We have to come back here and process it. Yeah. And then edit it. And that took some time. That took some time. And if we, we you know, we'd have eight to ten um, different film clips um, to get in the news, often <laughs> played in the wrong order. So I Jim, mean, <laughs> tell us yeah. about that. So yeah. how long did it take from the time a reporter shot film, got it back to the station to be processed. What was the turnaround time if you really had a breaking news story? I mean, what was what was the uh, hour, hour and a half? Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. I mean, we could we could force the processors. Mhm. Mm Wouldn't come out like we'd wanted to, but we could force it. Yeah, I mean, they would bring it in and you know, loop it over all these things, process it. Then you have to get it and edit it. And editing wasn't all that easy now. That was actually cutting the film and pasting it. Splicing it together. Splicing it together. Wow. But that was remarkable technology at the time. Yes. That something would happen in this area that we, you had film. Yes. It was edited together. The guy was in the studio telling the story. You showed the clip and people, through the magic of television, saw it right then and there. That was, that yes. was pretty astounding. Yes. Hard to do, but uh, it was all in a day's work. So how long was it until videotape? Yeah, I don't, know. I don't you know, know the exact. I don't know that I, I, I would uh, uh, argue a little bit, so a little, not hard, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, that we had the first videotape recorder in North Carolina. It was a VR-1000, now we'll forget it, Ampex, VR-1000, two-inch tape, two-inch tape. Big, big reels, and we couldn't believe it. I mean, we could record video 
and look back at it and you could not distinguish between live and recorded. You know, that's when things really, that was a, a big turning point. So were these two inch tape uh, recorders, could you take them out in the field? Well, uh, not initially, we did, but we put it in a truck. Right. Yeah, we yeah. had a truck. Looked so like you do live events probably. Yeah, we did like a, it looked like a bakery truck. Mm -hmm. Had the uh, uh, recorder in it, and we would take that with us on remotes. I think got smaller and smaller. I mean, right, but yeah. sporting events probably initially, yes. a big event or something that you mm -hmm. could record and, and show at a later time or even in a newscast, that's, right. that's how you started off. You were kind of the, the food truck. <laughs> we were the food truck. Of, of, of the yeah, the, we, were, the, we were doing, and I don't know exactly the date, but uh, a, our, this, our number one highest rated program by far was championship wrestling. Really? Yep. Live wrestling? It was not live. We recorded it. Oh. We tape recorded it. Because a lot of stations at that time had a wrestling match that they put in their studios behind the cameras. They'd turn them around and you had a better, you had a better plan. You, yes. had, you had tape and you'd we tape, had tape it to bring it We'd back. do them on Wednesday nights. Oh my gosh. We had, ble uh, we had uh, bleachers. We'd have maybe a couple hundred people here. You did it here? We did it here in the studio. There was a, a wonderful man, Joe Murnick, who was the uh, Eastern uh, wrestling promoter. It was his business. Worked with Joe for years and years, and he would bring the guys in, um, and, and we would record it on Wednesday night. Then we'd send it to maybe 30 stations. You distributed it we as well? We distributed it for Joe, yeah. And when did it run on the on WRL? What well, time? That's interesting. Um, I got more and more uh, involved with actually programming the station, uh, and I had uh, I had a goal of getting Wide World of Sports on live. Remember the opening to Wide World of Sports? Absolutely. With Howard Cosell. Oh. Okay, we didn't take Wide World of Sports on Saturday at five because we ran championship wrestling, which was the highest rated program in the market. Oh my gosh. Followed by uh, Porter Wagner and the Will, uh, Porter Wagner and Arthur Smith, which is the second and third highest rated programs on the, that five to seven block on Saturday afternoon. I mean, people- So what, wrestling was an hour? Wrestling, five to six. And then uh, Arthur Smith and Porter Wagner. My gosh. That was some block of program. Wow. And I bet people didn't ever miss it. They, they never missed it. Yeah. So how am I going to run Wide World of Sports <laughs> from 5 to 6.30? Well. Well. Uh, <laughs> that was not going to happen. Wow. Uh, so I, I convinced the powers that be that... Wrestling would be very successful Saturday nights at 11.30. Um, and I, I, I think people were very concerned about that move, but it worked out fine. Wrestling did fine for years at 11.30 on Saturday night, and we got Wide World of Sports Zone. And eventually, uh, Arthur Smith and Porter Wagner kind of Faded out. Faded out. We're the, <laughs> but we're the big uh, wrestling. Uh, I really enjoyed working with the Murnix now. And I don't, this, uh, this would always upset Joe when I would tell people this, is they would go out there and wrestle and everything. And then we'd all go over to the Velvet Cloak for dinner together. <laughs> <laughs> now that was a, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, that sounds like a, a lot of great fun. But then things started to change. You mentioned the first two inch Ampex tape machine yes. that really started to change the landscape yes and that was just the beginning yes one thing it <clears throat> allowed us to do is um, pre-record things like station breaks so remember here we're going to a station break we'd have a live booth announcer we'd have to play two or three different films and we'd have two or three slides all of which has to happen in 90 seconds. And so um, 
we really improved the operation by pre-recording a lot of stuff. Now, you just said something I want you to explain yeah. for people that aren't familiar with it. Stations back then used slides and they yes. had a slide machine, yes. which was a monster. Yes. It was a big, big piece of equipment with a rotating wheel on it. Yes. And you would insert the, fly, uh, the uh, slides in there and the camera, I guess, fit in there somewhere right. to be able mm -hmm. to see them. Mm -hmm. And that's how you got different still images. That's how we got different still images on the air. Almost all the graphics were on slides, right? We wouldn't, and uh, and that same camera, that same system would also you'd also play the film on that same system. But the uh, the point I wanted to make is we really improved uh, our production quality when we got the videotape and we could do stuff ahead of time. That was my, that's what I. So after it went to two inch, was three quarter inch the next format that became yeah, I prevalent? Think, well, I, uh, you know, we, two inch uh, was the quality format. Um, we had the, the, some stations went to three quarter. Remember, we had the uh, Betamax VHS competition. Uh, they then developed a great line of one inch video recorders that were were very good and so we went through all of those when you wouldn't think of having a recorder now everything is now on hard drive and through all the technical changes uh, because of your interest from the engineering side and technology if there was something new you wanted to yeah, have it. I thought you know there are a couple of things about that um, I think you need to have, as a basic principle, if you can improve your product, you should. Now, you can't be crazy, I mean, but the idea is, if you can go from black and white to color, you probably ought to go to color. You know, if you can go from analog to digital, you need to get on with the digital. Just as, just as a matter of customer service. Uh, this, this, but the, se the second part to me is I wanted, I've always wanted WRL to be the known um, for leadership and technology. I call it first to market. You know, there are two business concepts that you'll hear people argue about. One is first to market, I'm going to be first to market, that's really important. The second is, oh no, oh no, you want to be second or third, let other people spend the money. Let them figure out whether it works or not. If it works, you do it. If it doesn't, let them. That, that second one, I don't get that one. Mm -hmm. And I think you go after it. And I've heard you say several times that, uh, you know, there are many pieces of equipment in the archive where you have serial number one. Yes, well that was, uh, I would like to tell you about digital. Um, so, the uh, industry comes up with a new standard, new broadcast standard, new technology standard that would allow us to do high definition. I saw it several years before the U.S. had a standard when Japan, the NHK network, brought <clears throat> high definition to Congress and showed it to them. And I went up and looked at it. Theirs was an analog system, by the way, not digital. So I had my eyes on it, uh, but I mean, it was the, you can't, the difference, would you watch sports now if it wasn't in HD? No, no, I mean, it's, it was a huge difference. So as soon as that became uh, uh, authorized, okay, well first, while they were doing the standard and were testing it, we put an experimental station on the air. I wanted to figure out what it is, get everybody here used to it. So we put on an experimental station, um, and th we were then ready uh, when the transition happened um, to go right on as high definition. And we did. We were the first station on, and we also we also did the first high definition newscast. And in fact, uh, you were granted the first license for that in 1996. Okay. And, uh, and that was a jumping off point where you were first in the country to have yes. an HD newscast. And I remember that was, that was huge. 
that was a big deal. And then so the next few years are convincing people that they need to get another TV and that it's worth it. And uh, I think it changed everything. I, I think I definitely changed it. And by the way, we're getting ready to do that again. So we, when we went to high definition, the standard was ATSC, ATSC. I guess you call it 1.0 first. And um, okay, we found that the, so the you know the thing that I was very excited about was is that I wanted these. I want this to be a TV set. I wanted to have a tuner in it, so you punch it and you can watch Channel Five live, you know, watch now on the, we believed that we would be able to do that with ATSC, but we couldn't. The signal uh, was not robust enough, there wasn't enough error correction. So we came up with ATSC 2.0, and we now broadcast a separate signal for mobile which works better, uh, but the phone people won't put the 